This video is published under the Creative Commons license BY and CSA, which means attribution, non-commercial and share-alike. Third-party material has been used for which the permission is specified explicitly for every diagram, photograph or whatever has been used. Please mention the author as Andreas Pfennig, Products, Environment and Processes, Department of Chemical Engineering, Université de Liège, Belgium. A disclaimer applies. Welcome back to this lecture on thermal unit operations. We are still in the introductory section and today I would like to show you a little bit about the principal methods that are used in order to design these thermal unit operations. We have seen in the previous lectures that on the one hand side we are regarding thermal, these entire equipment as a set, so to speak, of uh, theoretical stages. So we subdivide mentally the entire equipment into um, theoretical stages and we know that on each stage we have the equilibrium but they, the stages now have to be linked somehow and the question is how do we link them? And of course one way to do that is to th use balances. Now what is a balance? I assume that if you are taking, uh, if you are studying chemical engineering you have been told how to apply balances, how they work in principle and in detail uh, already in other lectures. Nevertheless, I would like to mention to you here in principle some fundamental statements about a balance. In a very general way, a balance can be written like this. The change within a control volume equals what is entering minus what is leaving plus what is produced minus what is consumed. And as a simple example for a control volume, you see here a purse where uh, we want to, or we, where we can, uh, set up the balance for the money inside that purse. So very important for setting up a balance is to uh, well define a control volume, where this control volume, so to speak, is the system we are regarding. And we mentally uh, divide this system from its environment, and then we regard what is passing through the boundary of this control volume and what is happening inside. Passing the control volume boundary are the entering amounts or streams and what is leaving is also regarded across the boundaries of this control volume. Again, amounts or flow rates, streams. It always depends if you want to set up the balance. Later on we will see it when we apply it. Uh, if you want to set, uh, set it up for a more or less batch process, that is a process where we have temporal changes, or if you set it up for a steady state process, continuous processes, then we are more likely to use streams or fluxes for these um, terms in expressing what is entering and what is leaving. Then we regard what is being produced and what is consumed, and this refers to the inside of the uh, control volume, so what is happening within the boundaries of the control volume, what's happening inside the system, and especially if, for example, in our case, chemical reactions occur, then certain components can be produced and certain other components are being consumed, so we have to take these two terms into account. In most part of this lecture, in the fundamental um, chapter, so to speak, these will be neg neglected because we are uh, neglecting or we assume that we don't have any chemical reaction taking place, so we can neglect these two terms. And of course, applying this to the purse is relatively simple. Some uh, money is entering, so somebody gives you some money, you put it into the purse, you pay something from your money, you take it out of the purse, that is a negative stream. Well, production and consumption of money within the purse is not the typical case, I should say, if you have some, well, goose lying golden eggs or so, you can regard that as uh, the term for production. And if you burn some of your money, uh, some paper money, then you can regard that as being some consumption of the money. It's gone after that. It's simply not there anymore. Okay, so this is one way we want to uh, set up equations that describe what's going on in the um, separation processes. 
So we use the balances later on to link, for example, the theoretical stages, because we have seen when we define that, that there are fluxes connecting the different theoretical stages. And if there are fluxes connecting them, we can set up balances for these fluxes. Yeah, so we use the balances to connect the different theoretical stages. And then we know on each stage we have equilibrium and between the stages or for the entire equipment we can set up the balances. So we will always be combining on the one hand side equilibrium information, on the other hand side these balances. Now the question is of course which property to balance? Yeah, what are the properties, the variables we set up the balance for? And of course the easiest way to set up a balance where we directly see that they should be that we should be able to balance them are uh, properties that don't change, that are conserved. And conserved quantities, of course, we know some of them, mass possibly, energy, momentum, you know all that, presumably from the physics course at high school, uh, possibly, or from somewhere else. And the question is, well, how fundamental are these statements and what are really the what is the, how should I say, the ground for these, the basis for uh, these conserved quantities. And actually, if you want to understand how fundamental these conserved properties, these conserved quantities are, we have to refer to Emmy Noether, who is a German, or who was a German mathematician between 1882 and 1935. And she found the so-called Noether theorem. And the Noether theorem combines on the one hand side invariances of physical laws to conserved properties. You can show on very fundamental grounds that if the physical laws are time invariant, they don't change as a function of time, then the energy has to be conserved. This doesn't mean that Time doesn't play any role in the physical laws. It only means that the physical law, the structure of the physical law, today is the same as it is tomorrow, as it is in a thousand years, as it is in a million years. So the structure of the physical law doesn't change. And because of that, energy has to be conserved. The same applies for the invariance with respect to space. That means the physical law applies here, it applies, applies on the moon, in the sun, in the Andromeda galaxy or wherever you want to apply it uh, because these physical laws are invariant in place the momentum has to be conserved and finally since the physical laws are orientation independent that means if you apply it in this direction or in some other direction it will be the same physical law the angular momentum has to be conserved so these conserved properties are fundamental they are representing, so to speak, the nature of our physical laws, of the world as we experience it. Because the world is the way we experience it, energy, momentum and angular momentum have to be conserved and they have to be strictly conserved. Now I mentioned previously that um, mass should be conserved. That's something you learn at school possibly. Mass doesn't show up. Hmm, how come? Well, actually, we have to regard this energy a little bit more closely. And if we do that, we know, of course, since Albert Einstein, that the energy and mass are sort of linked. Now, the, if you have some mass, some entity that has a mass, then you have to multiply it with the squared velocity of light, or speed of light, and that corresponds to the energy content within that, or corresponding to that mass. So mass also is energy. And well, why can we now set up energy balances and mass balances separately? How come? Yeah, that's what we usually do in chemical engineering, in setting up the balances. We use mass balances and we use energy balances. But actually it's only one balance, it's the energy balance because mass and energy are linked like that. Now, the reason for that is actually that the energies are taking place at totally different levels. On the one hand side we have the mass that is 
that contains, if you evaluate that, very high energy content. So the amount of energy related to Mars is very high. Which also means that if you want to change that, you need lots of energy. And in usual chemical engineering processes, you don't have that energy available. That means, the other way around, Mars is more or less conserved. It doesn't change because you don't have enough energy to change that significantly. So because of that, we can assume that the elementary particles, the atoms, are more or less unchanged in our chemical engineering processes. And because of that, the energy related to mass is constant. And that means, of course, in turn, also the mass is constant. So because of that, in all those reactions where the energy levels that we regard of in our conversions are low, and in chemical reactions, still the energy conversion is pretty low as compared to the mass that we have associated, as to the energy that we have associated with the mass. That is more or less keeping constant. So we regard mass as a conserved quantity in most of the cases. Only exceptions are, of course, if nuclear reactions are taking place. So if you are a chemical engineer who has to take nuclear reactions into account, for example, considering nuclear power plants, balances setting up, uh, setting up balances for nuclear power plants, you have to take that into account. But if you don't, if you are just running ordinary chemical processes, then you can regard mass as being a conserved property in itself. On the other hand side, of course, we have all the low level energies as compared to the energies associated with mass, which is the energy of the chemical bonds, which is a significant amount usually. Uh, then heat, kinetic energy, so bodies are moving, and potential energies we have as well. And there are other forms of energy that you might take into account in certain cases. So this consideration, so to sp speak, splits up the energy into two main fractions. On the one hand side, those related to mass, leading to mass being a conserved property in most of the applications in chemical engineering. And of course, then the rest has to be uh, conserved as well, because the overall energy is conserved. And if mass is conserved, that means that, of course, the rest has to be conserved as well. So we can also set up uh, conservation laws for these properties, the sum of all the remaining energies. And that's what we actually do. We set up the mass balances and we set the energy, set up the ba energy balance. And with energy, we don't mean the energy associated to mass usually, but are rather these energies that are mentioned here. That is the energy in the chemical bonds, the chemical reaction energy, so to speak, if uh, conversions occur, heat, kinetic and potential energies, and possibly others, as I said before, for specific applications. So now we can, we, we know that the conserved properties actually are one more in most of the cases that we regard as chemical engineers, its mass additionally to the rest of the energy. So the energy has been reduced to only these contributions and the mass has been regarded separately, so to speak. And now we can set up those variables or can write down those variables that we can regard as being conserved at least under certain conditions. Mass. As I said, without any nuclear reaction, mass is conserved. Then, if additionally uh, no chemical reaction takes place, of course, also the mass of each individual chemical component is unchanged, is also conserved. So if no chemical reaction occurs, then the mass of a, each individual component in a mixture, and in chemical engineering we are dealing with mixtures, each mass of each component is conserved. Now, if no chemical reaction occurs and the mass of a species, of a component, is constant, then we can usually also assume that the molar mass of that component is constant, which means that the amount of substance, the overall amount of substance without chemical reaction is constant, as well as the amount of, the subs of, of, of substance of a specific component of an individual molecular species. So if no chemical reactions occur, then the mass of a component, the mass of this, uh, the amount of substance, the overall of the overall mixture, as well as for each individual component, can be regarded as constant. 
if chemical reactions occur, these three properties are not constant anymore. They are not conserved across that process that we regard anymore. Then we have seen before that the atoms are uh, constant conserved species, so to speak, without nuclear reactions. So that relates to the mass, so to speak. They are linked directly. And then also the rest, of course, the remaining energy that without mass uh, is constant as long as no nuclear reaction has to be regarded. And then momentum and angular momentum are conserved quantities as well. So we can set up the balances for these conserved quantities at least under certain conditions. They are conserved and so we can set up those uh, balances. And actually we can set up the balances without taking into account any changes within the system. Yeah, so the production and um, uh, uh, the loss term, they can be neglected if the properties we regard, we set up the balance for if they are conserved. So we only have to regard for these properties under these conditions, we only have to regard the change within the entering and the leaving uh, amounts or fluxes. That means, of course, on the other hand side, we can also set up the balances in case these things change. So we can set up balances also for non-conserved quantities as long as we are somehow able to quantify the change. So if a chemical reaction occurs, we can nevertheless set up the balance. We only have to say something about the reaction rate. As soon as we know the reaction rate, for example, we are able to quantify the change in the mass of a component, the change in the amount of substance or the amount of substance of a specified component. So we can set up balances for quantities that are not conserved as well as long as we can quantify that. Well, actually, stepping back, uh, one has to look what we have now. We have the balances that we want to apply. We know that we can apply them for conserved quantities and we can apply them for non-conserved quantities under certain conditions. As I said, if we, want to, if we know how quick the changes are, if we can quantify these changes, the production rates for example. But we can also set up the balances without knowing that. Sometimes balances are actually being set up in order to back out the change. Yeah, so you can set up the balance in general terms. You know some reaction occurs and you want to determine the reaction rate from balancing other quantities that you can measure, for example. So you set up the balance nevertheless, even though you don't know the change rate of the regarded quantity and then you are able to back out the change rate, the rate of change of that regarded quantity. So even then you are able to uh, to set up the balance. You only have the rate of change as a variable and you are then able to back it out from the balances. And one should say balances are always exact. There no, is no, usually no way to get around the balances. The only thing that can happen is that you forgot some contributions to the balance, that you evaluated some contributions in the wrong way, perhaps you forgot some entering or leaving stream, perhaps you forgot some change within uh, that you would have to uh, account for, yeah, some production inside or whatever, some reaction that you neglected that nevertheless occurs. And then of course the balance, the evaluation of the balance is wrong, but the balance in itself, the fundamental structure of the balance, that's exact. It's something we can stick to, it always has to be fulfilled 100%. So you can evaluate it in a wrong way, you can make errors in evaluation, but you cannot, but the balance in itself is fundamentally without error. Okay, so we have these conserved quantities. We know that we can set up balances for these conserved quantities as well as for quantities that are not conserved. So even if some of these assumption are not, assumptions are not fulfilled, we can nevertheless set up the corresponding balances. And with that we can collect, so to speak, those equations, those methods that we now have at hand to quantify the behavior of a unit operation 
of whatever in order to be able to describe the quantity uh, quantitatively. And that refers then to the chemical engineering methods and that is usually summarized as a so-called mesh equations. And mesh is just the first letters of setting up the material balances for each component for the equilibrium between the phases. This directly corresponds to the theoretical stages, the concept of theoretical stages mentioned in one of the last lectures. And now we have to consider that if we set up the material balance for each component individually, we somehow have to account for the fact that the mole fractions or the mass fractions, for example, they add up to unity in either phase. And that means that we have to consider also the summation equation. Summation condition just means adding up the fractions of, a comp of all components in a given phase has to add up to unity. And then the H uh, stands for, well, heat, but actually, of course, it's not heat balances, but it's actually energy balances. And with energy balances, all the remaining energy contributions beside mass are regarded. So that is the set of the equations that we apply over and over again. Balances, as you can see, the summation condition is usually, um, well, you have it, but you don't consider it significantly. It's, well, it's there, but it's not any, it's not tedious to evaluate that. It's not tedious to write it down. It's just there. Uh, setting up the balances for energy and uh, material is usually much more complicated or significantly more complicated. And equilibrium is also some effort to do that because you have to apply possibly um, chemical engineering thermodynamics or have to use some graphical representation of the equilibrium. So the mesh equations are those equations that are set up and then solved for the special case of each individual unit operation. So with that I have shown you the methods that we have at hand in order to quantify the changes that occur within separation processes in thermal unit operations. But of course this applies for chemical engineering in general. Yeah, so if you even have, if you have reactors or other unit operations, that holds as well. With that I would like to summarize those things I've told you. On the one hand side we have seen that we have two major tools that we again and again apply, equilibrium and balances, and they are summarized as these mesh equations. And also one thing which is relatively important if we talk about balances and about conserved quantities, we can set up balances also for non-conserved quantities if the variation can be quantified or taking into account all the discussion I have uh, mentioned before. We can even set it up if we cannot quantify it but if you want to back out that change. So with that I have shown you all those methods. This is all. There isn't any more that we can apply for um, designing uh, thermal separation processes. And with that, I will leave you for today or for now. Um, I've told you something about the methods, and I would be happy if you would join me next time. Thanks.